For the last part of lecture CC2, we're going to talk about the concept of enzymes. While these are not a different class of biomolecules, in fact, enzymes are always protein, and in a very few cases, you might see some RNA as part of them. Uh, they're not a, se a separate kind of biomolecule, but they play a, such an important role in biochemistry that we really need to talk about them. And the concept here is that the reactions that we need to happen when we're looking at biochemistry are not always the most likely ones. So you remember when we talked about how two amino acids come together to form a peptide bond. Imagine taking two amino acids and just randomly throwing them at each other. Do you think that coming together in just the right way so the carboxyl of one and the amine group of the other are arranged just right so that those bonds break and snap and reform to form a peptide bond is really the most likely thing to happen. I guarantee you, it's not. There are so many other possible ways that two amino acids could interact that that's really far from likely. And yet, amino acids coming together to make protein happens many, many times per second in just about every one of the cells in your body. Out of all the ways two amino acids can interact, that's one of the most common ones inside the body. So how do we go from something that's very, very unlikely to very likely? How do we shape that? So one analogy I sometimes use for this is to imagine this. Take a dry erase, dry erase marker and take off the cap. Now, get a friend and have them toss the cap at you and you toss the pen at them. Now, is it possible, not likely, but possible that they would come together in just the right way to cap the pen? I would say yes, that is possible. But all of the other ways they could hit, if they hit at all, let's assume they bounce into each other, there's so many ways that that is not the most likely. And honestly, it's even especially unlikely because getting that cap on there requires you not just to have them come in, but also to put a little extra energy into it. To have that happen just by random chance, they'd have to come together in just the right way with just the right amount of energy, virtually impossible. Not totally impossible though, just extremely unlikely. If I imagine that I take my garage and take all the gravity away and take uh, 400,000 uncapped pens and just throw them in and stir it up and I come back a week later, how many pens will be capped, do you think? One, two, maybe? If we, left it, if we let it just bounce around for a week, maybe a few, but out of 100,000, probably not very many. And even if some of them did cap, it's not impossible that another one would hit it in such a way to knock the cap off. So, it's an unlikely interaction. Just like if I had all those amino acids, it's unlikely that they're going to come together to make a protein. But now imagine we do this. Make a machine that has a socket on it where uncapped pen will stick nicely and another one where cap will stick. And when those both arrive on this machine, it guides them together. If they hit, it goes and guides them together in just the right way where they can get put together. If I take some of those machines and toss them into the room with the caps, and just they're bouncing around randomly, the caps might bump into them in such a way, but if they do, it's going to guide how they come together, put them on little rails. Suddenly, that reaction becomes a lot more likely. And that machine doesn't even have to push them together. All it has to do is maybe guide them down a little funnel so that that's the more likely way that they'll come together. That machine is doing a similar job to what enzymes do. An enzyme in your cell will have at least one location, an active site, where it can bind what we call the substrate. I'll write all this down in a moment in such a way that it guides substrates to have a particular kind of reaction. So we say that enzymes do a process called catalysis. They catalyze a particular reaction. Catalyzing a reaction means making that reaction more likely. 
it makes that particular way that the molecule or molecules could act more likely than the other ways. But it's important, enzymes do not provide energy. And they are not used up in the reaction. They don't take part directly in the reaction. No part of the enzyme breaks off and bonds with the other things or becomes part of the molecule. The enzyme is still usable afterwards. It's like our machine that guides our pen and cap together and then releases it. The machine can then do it again. So enzymes don't take part in the reaction and they don't provide energy. They just make that particular reaction more likely. They're a machine that does that. That process we call catalyzing a reaction or catalysis. Now, how they do that, well, that's a whole different question. And think about the pen capping machine we made. We had to set this thing up so it could bind to uncapped pen and cap, and then when they were bound, guide them together in a particular way. So it was a complex machine. But we talked about proteins and how versatile they are. You could imagine a protein whose shape was folded up so that it could bind to two particular molecules and when they bound that would cause it to change shape in just the right way to bring those two molecules together or you could imagine a different enzyme which binds to takes capped pen and when capped pen binds it changes shape in just the right way to cause a different reaction the reverse reaction to happen you could have two different enzymes one of which catalyzes capping the other catalyzes uncapping put those in the room and that reaction becomes much, much more likely. Some, for some enzymes, it's ex extremely more likely. There are some enzymes that are very, very effective and some that are less effective. But let's talk for a moment about how that works. To do that, we need to talk about the concept of reaction energy. If you've had chemistry, you're familiar with this idea. So let's talk about Let's talk about a reaction that uh, happens, that you, let's say you go to a campfire and you burn some wood. So that reaction would be wood plus oxygen. Here we get ash, CO2, and water, the stuff you get afterwards. On this axis of the graph, we have available energy. And what I'm going to say is that wood, as a large complex set of biomolecules, has a lot of stored energy in it. Whereas ash and carbon dioxide, more disorganized and free, has less energy available in it. Which means that going from wood to here, I go from having more energy to having less energy. Now, energy can't just disappear. Energy has to go somewhere. So when I light wood on fire and it turns into ash, CO2, and water, what else do I get? Light, heat, noise. This energy difference here goes into light, heat, sound, all those things that the campfire is giving off. Now, one of the laws of thermodynamics says that the total amount of disorder in the universe must always go up. This is going from a highly ordered state to a disordered state. All of this release of energy increases the amount of disorder in the universe. Reactions like this are favorable. They tend to go. Reactions that require you to put things together and make them more orderly, you have to put energy into that. We'll get to that in a moment. But, so wood and oxygen to ash, CO2, and water is a favorable reaction, exothermic, exergonic. So why doesn't it just happen on its own? I mean, there's trees outside my garage right now. They're made of wood, there's oxygen in the air. Why are they not all bursting into flame if that's such a favorable reaction? If I take some wood and set it at the campfire, it doesn't just suddenly combust. What do I have to do to get it started? Well, if I want to start a fire, I use a match or a lighter. And think about what that's doing. I need to apply some heat to that wood to get it to start burning. That's because this is not really the full reaction diagram. The full reaction diagram looks like this. Wood and oxygen is here. This is what we call a transition state. 
I have to provide some energy to the wood to get the bonds in the wood to change in the right way to make it easy for oxygen to start that reaction. In other words, I have to kind of bring that wood into a activated state, an excited state, and then the reaction can start. Now, once I get it started and I'm releasing all this energy, some of that energy can go back to the next piece of wood and bring it up to its transition state and release a bunch of energy, which can go into the wood around it. In other words, once I start the wood burning, enough heat is released to bring the rest of the wood up to that energy and allow it to keep burning. It tends to keep itself going. It's sort of a chain reaction. But I do have to put some energy into it to get it to start. I have to use a match or a lighter or something to provide energy into this reaction. Now, what a catalyst does, a catalyst cannot change these. It cannot change the amount of energy in the wood and oxygen or the ash CO2 and water. What it can do, if I consider this amount of energy what we call activation energy, What a catalyst can do is reduce the activation energy. So this is with a catalyst. I don't, I don't know of a catalyst off the top of my head that does this for wood and oxygen, but maybe one exists. So if I have the right catalyst, it makes it easy for the wood and oxygen to get together in the right way, which means I don't need to put as much energy into it to cause it to happen. This is a little bit like saying, in my pen capping analogy, to get this pen and this cap together, not only do they have to come together in their white way, but there has to be some energy. Whoops, see, it didn't even work. There has to be energy available to get them to go past this resistance point where I have to put energy into it, and then it snaps into place. Putting the energy into getting it over that little bump is the activation energy, and once that happens, it goes on nicely. In order to get these to come together, I have to put some energy into it, throw them hard to get them to come together. But an enzyme can kind of guide that into happening more easily. There's still energy required, but I don't have to do it in such a way that I don't have to put quite as much energy into it to get it to occur. So enzymes, catalysts, lower the activation energy needed for a reaction. In this case, it would a catalyst, if I put the right catalyst on that wood, it might burst into flame because the amount of energy just present in the movement of oxygen around in the air, just regular, the energy of the movement of those molecules might be enough to get us over that bump. So it would make that reaction easy and likely. Now, if we take a look at two amino acids coming together into a uh, dipeptide, that reaction looks a little different two amino acids coming together into a dipeptide plus water, this is the reaction, energy, reaction diagram there. That actually has more energy stored in it than the separate amino acids, which means I have to put energy into this reaction, not just to get it into activation energy, but to get it to happen at all. And really our reaction diagram looks like this there is still some activation energy in that. My catalyst cannot change where these, these bars are. A catalyst cannot make this into a reaction that releases energy. This reaction will always require this much energy. The catalyst can make it easier to get it started by reducing the activation energy needed, but it can't actually make the hill that we have to climb any shorter. And if enzymes cannot provide energy, how does this work? Well, it's true that enzymes can't provide energy, but one thing they can do is enzymes can couple reactions together. In other words, an enzyme can catalyze more than one reaction it could catalyze one reaction that releases energy and channel that energy into another, action that, another reaction that requires the energy. In biochemistry, the most common energy releasing reaction is ATP goes to ADP plus phosphate. I take that adenosine with three phosphates and break off one of the phosphates. That actually releases a lot of energy. 
And there are a number of enzymes which combine these. They'll have one spot that can take an ATP and catalyze the break off of that, of that other phosphate, thus releasing the energy, and channel that into doing something else, catalyzes another reaction that requires energy. So the enzyme isn't supplying the energy, but it's channeling energy from one thing to another. In our pen capping analogy, you might imagine that our enzyme on its own, if, when these things bind, it's gonna have enough trouble, it's gonna have trouble just gradually kind of bringing them together hard enough to do that. So let's do something else. Let's put a bunch of firecrackers floating around in the room and our pen capping machine will have another spot on it where a firecracker can bind. And when it binds, it lights the firecracker. Maybe when it binds, it scrapes the fuse against something. So cap and pen, firecracker, when the firecracker ignite, cracker ignites, bang, that pushes these parts of the machine together, capping the pen. The enzyme isn't providing the energy, it's channeling the energy from the exploding firecracker, going whomp, and capping the pen. So that might be sort of how this would work. You could have an enzyme that takes two amino acids, breaks an ATP, and uses that energy to bring those amino acids together. Off the top of my head, I don't know if that's how that one works, but it's the right idea. It's one way this could work. So, enzymes catalyze particular chemical reactions. For each reaction, you'll have an an enzyme that can make that reaction happen or not happen. Now, given all of the stuff that happens in your cell, all of the complicated biochemistry and all the ways these things have to interact, you can imagine you need a lot of enzymes. You need enzymes for putting amino acids together. You need them for taking them apart. You need them for building DNA. You need it for taking apart DNA. You need it for putting ATP together. You need it for taking all, every reaction's gotta have an enzyme, mostly but we don't want them all happening at the same time. If I had the enzyme that puts amino acids together and the enzyme that takes them apart active at the same moment at the same time, I'm not gonna get anywhere. I'm gonna build a protein and disassemble it. That's not useful. So I need a way to make certain enzymes happen or not happen. I need a way to regulate them, to turn them on or off. So I need some way of getting enzymes to be more or less active. And there's two overall ways we're gonna talk about that. One of them is what we call allosteric regulation. Allosteric, allo means other, steric means shape. Allosteric regulation means changing the function of the enzyme by changing its shape. So let's imagine that we want to do this reaction. We want to have half triangle and half triangle become full triangle. And what I've got is an enzyme with an active site. This is what we call the active site. This would be the substrate. These two half triangles is the substrate. They will bind to the active site of the enzyme and when they bind the enzyme will bring them together to make full triangle. So that's the reaction we're catalyzing. Allosteric regulation means that somewhere else on here we're going to have a regulatory site. So this thing is the enzyme. There's its active site. Here's a regulatory site. So let's say that what we've got is our enzyme with its active site and regulatory site. And when some other molecule, a regulator molecule, binds to the regulatory site, that's going to change the shape of my enzyme. It makes this thing in the middle grow. So that when it's bound, my two half triangles can't interact. 
So having that regulator molecule bound to the enzyme makes the enzyme not work. It changes the shape of the active site so that it can't catalyze the reaction. This is an example of allosteric inhibition. The regulator binds to the regulatory site and it changes the shape of the active site. In the case of allosteric inhibition, it changes the shape of the active site so that the enzyme doesn't work as well. It doesn't catalyze the reaction as well. It might make it not work at all, or it might just slow it down. You can also have allosteric activation, where the binding of the regulatory site actually makes the enzyme work better. It enhances its action. Either way can work, but in both cases they work the same way. Binding the regulator to the regulatory site changes the shape of the active site. That's allosteric regulation. That's one way we can regulate enzymes. So if I want an enzyme to turn off, then what I can do is have a regulator molecule that binds to a regulatory site and changes the active site so it doesn't work as well. That way, that, en that enzyme won't work and other enzymes can cause those substrates to do something else. Now, the other way to regulate these enzymes is called competitive inhibition. In competitive inhibition, what we have is some other molecule which binds to or in the active site. This is an inhibitor. It's not the right substrate. The enzyme can't do anything with it. But when it's bound there, it prevents the substrate from getting there. So a competitive inhibitor is a molecule which binds close to or in the active site. And prevents the substrate from binding. That's why we call it competitive. It's competing with the substrate for that spot. And there's lots of ways that this can work out. In some cases, you have competitive inhibitors which are temporary. They bind, but then they come back out. So it's sort of slowing down the enzyme or temporarily turning it off. In other cases, you have irreversible inhibitors which bind to the active site and don't let go meaning that enzyme is now useless. The cell's going to have to break it down and make a new one that doesn't have the competitive inhibitor on it. So a lot of, for example, poisons work that way. There are a number of poisons which are competitive inhibitors of enzymes. They block the enzyme from doing something it's supposed to do, and that disrupts your biochemistry. So these are two ways you can regulate enzymes. Allosteric regulation, whether that's activation or inhibition, that's, al that's almost always reversible. The regulator usually binds, but can come off. Or competitive inhibition, where something blocks the active site. That might be reversible, or it might not, depending. Okay, so given that we can now regulate our enzymes, what can we do with that? Well, this leads to our last topic for this, which is the idea of a biochemical pathway. Let's say we have some molecule A, and we can make that into B, and that can be made into C, and that can be made into D. I want to make D. I have A. Each of these steps probably has an enzyme. So if I've got the right enzyme, that can turn A into B, and then another enzyme can turn B into C, and another enzyme can turn C into D. So then if I have A and all three enzymes, I'll get D.
But how do I control how much D I make? Well, it's not that uncommon that you might have a situation where D is actually an allosteric inhibitor of this enzyme. That gets weird. Okay, so that means if I have A and I have all these enzymes, then A gets made into B, which gets made into C, which gets made into D, and D shuts off this enzyme, so I stop making A into B. Okay, so I make a certain amount of D, and then as the amount of D builds up, it turns off this pathway, so I don't make any more D. That, and then as the D do, goes off and does whatever it's going to do, as D goes away, A starts getting made into B again. So that, in that case, you have a pathway which kind of self-regulates. I'll make a certain amount of D, but once the levels of D rise, D turns off this pathway, so I don't make any more until the D I've made goes away and does stuff. This would be something we call end product inhibition, where the last thing in the line inhibits one of the earlier enzymes in the line. Uh, one example of this is the enzyme phosphofructokinase, and you don't have to know this, which is involved in one of the uh, cell metabolism processes where we, turn, we take glucose and use it to make ATP, is inhibited by ATP. So I take glucose and I start metabolizing it, turning it into ATP, and then as I get enough ATP, it inhibits the phosphofructokinase, which then stops that process. So I don't, make, I don't just keep burning my glucose to make lots of ATP when I've got enough ATP. Kind of makes sense. And this can, get, this can have other interesting things happen too. Let's imagine this situation, where C can be made into D, and then D can be made into either E or F, each of which has its own enzyme. Well, if I wanted to make a balanced amount of E and F, one way I might be able to do that is have F be an inhibitor for that enzyme, and E be an inhibitor for that enzyme. So let's say I start with A, and I start making a bunch of E. E, actually, sorry, bad professor. Let's think about that again. That would actually tend to make more of whatever I made. So as I start making E, E will actually inhibit that enzyme. And I won't make as much E, so I'll try to start to make F. But then as I make more F, I inhibit that enzyme. By that time, E is probably largely gone, so I start making more E again. You get the idea. I'm going to end up making some of both, rather than making all of one or the other. Actually, let's look at the mistake I made. The nice thing about mistakes is suddenly, is sometimes they do interesting things. What would this situation do? Think about that for a moment. As I make D, and let's say D starts turning into F. What's going to happen? Well, when I look at it, I say, if I'm making D and some of it turns into F, F inhibits the enzyme that makes E, which means once I start making F, that's all I'm going to make. So whichever path I go down first, I'm stopping the other pathway. So what we end up here is ways that by having the right things regulate things, you can have switches, like a railroad that can go down multiple tracks, and you switch it going one way or the other. That's the idea of a biochemical pathway. You can start with one thing, and then based on which enzymes you turn on or off, turn it into lots of things. And when those things themselves are regulators for other enzymes, your pathways can interact with each other, and you end up with these incredibly complicated biochemical processes, which, if you remember, is exactly what I needed for a living system. All right, that's the end of lecture CC2. See you next time.